Okay, Pastor, so you can hear me, right? I can hear you, yes, go ahead. Okay, 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 let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this uh, morning. Thank you for a brand new start, a brand new day, God. Um, Lord, um, I pray that as we uh, learn about you, learn your word today, God, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to not uh, just be hearers of your word, but doers of your word too, God. And Lord, I thank you for uh, helping uh, Pastor Tipipa to um, uh, share your heart with us, God. Thank you, Lord, that you would give her the wisdom and the understanding, God, to say the right uh, right things. And Lord, um uh, Teach the right thing, God. Uh, thank you for uh, helping all of us to uh, um, understand what you want us to uh, hear and uh, for everything else, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. All right. Um, we've reached almost the end of the Gospel of John. Uh, so. The goal is to complete John chapter 20 today and at least maybe half of John chapter 21. Um, as these are the two final chapters, uh, there are many details given here. And also there are some things which are debated upon you know, a lot uh, from these two chapters. And uh, so we would go a little slowly. So we may not be able to finish all of John chapter 21. Uh, but that's all right. We can take it up next class. So we'll begin for now with John chapter 20. And um, uh, maybe we can have someone read out verses 1 and 2. And uh, we'll begin our uh, you know, talk. Yeah. Early on Sunday morning, it was still dark. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran upon Simon Peter and the other disciples. The one whom Jesus loved, she said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Yeah. Um, in uh, Asha's translation, it just plainly says on Sunday morning. Uh, but then, you know, the original uh, uh, wording is basically on the first day of the week while it was still dark. Uh, so for them, the week would begin on Saturday evening because for them, the day always began on an evening. So evening to evening is how they would count all of their days according to their culture. So uh, for them, technically, uh, the first day of the week begins once the Sabbath ends. So the Sabbath day ends on Saturday and Saturday evening onwards is their new day beginning and there's a new week beginning. So um, Early on Sunday morning, while it is still dark, you have Mary coming over here to the tomb. And um, I, we know from the other Gospels that she does not come alone. She comes along with another five or more ladies because it's not very clear uh, how many of them there were totally. Uh, but you know, based on all the calculations that are made, either five women or in fact more than that came along. And uh, Mary Magdalene was one of them. So they come there as a group and um, um, they see that the stone has been removed from the entrance. So um, now uh, in the culture of those days, uh, you know, if you have a tomb uh, in which you are, you know, burying one generation after another of your family, so it's your family tomb. And uh, so you would have one very large stone uh, blocking it so that it cannot be easily you know opened and so that no one no one can you know harm the uh, remains of all the you know uh, corpses and the skeletons which are inside because it's a family thing right so to honor the family they would make sure that the entrance is well protected so uh, basically what they would do is they would uh, um, you know just in front of the uh, cave in front of the you know tomb they would uh, dig a deep channel so they would dig a deep channel and um, uh, you know they would um, create a groove over there and then this heavy large stone uh, would be placed inside that groove so it's not easy to just simply move the stone you know as you wish uh, so uh, 
it's, which is why we see in the other gospel, the women are discussing among themselves and they're wondering, you know, how are we going to move this really hefty stone? Uh, and moreover, they must have heard that a seal has been placed over there, you know, so that no one can tamper with it, um, um, however they wish. Uh, so they come over here discussing how they're going to open. And uh, we see that it has already been opened. Someone has already rolled the stone away. And uh, so they, uh, Mary comes here, and she sees that the stone has been removed. And uh, in verse 2, it says, uh, she goes running back to the disciples and reports about this. She tells them uh, that, the, um, that, the, that the tomb is already open and that there is no body inside. Uh, yes, Brother Shay, if you could, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Yes, Pastor, I, I was just gonna ask a question that was the motive of the women going um, based on the fact that Jesus said he was going to resurrect on the third day, or was this something else that they came to do to the body of Jesus Christ? Oh, uh, it's true. Um, now, it's not mentioned here in uh, John, but then when we look at the other Gospels, we see that they have gone over there with spices and with other, um, uh, you know, um, herbs and things like that, according to their custom. So obviously, they are going with the intention of doing further honors, you know, in showing respect to the dead, uh, because that is the way they would do things. Um, like we had talked last time, uh, for the first one or two years, uh, the body would be kept in a, uh, in a, in a, you know, kept in a separate place uh, where it can, you know, uh, where all the, where all the moisture inside can, you know, evaporate and it can shrivel up and the organs would become dry. So they are actually trying to get that whole process going. So they would be applying different things to the uh, dead body uh, to prepare it for the that entire burial process and then at the end of one or two years when that um, you know um, body has become shriveled enough then it it would be moved into one of those ossuaries into one of those compartments which are there inside the tomb and 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 you know another um, new member of the family would take their place on the table so it's like that it would go on generation after generation and these are family tombs uh, so of course here these we observed very carefully last time that a fresh new brand new to tomb is being used so there are no other corpses inside there are no other skeletons inside and um, uh, jesus is the only one who has been laid over there and uh, these ladies have now come with the spices and the herbs uh, to um, to perform whatever rituals they need to to prepare the body for you know um, its burial process. Uh, so no, there is absolutely no anticipation whatsoever that there is that a resurrection has taken place. Yeah. Uh, so she goes back to um, uh, Peter and the other disciple, uh, I, you know, who is obviously John over here, because John does not uh, prefer to name himself. And uh, we see her saying, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have put him. And then we move to verses 3 to 10. If we could have someone read out verses 3 to 10. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb both are running together but the other disciple outran peter and reached the tomb first and stooping to look in he saw the linen clothes lying there but he did not go in then simon peter came following him and went into the tomb he saw the linen clothes lying there and the face cloth which had been on jesus's head not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Amen. Yes. Uh, so here there's a mention made that when... Um, Peter looks inside and, uh, yeah, Peter goes inside. John, on the other hand, just simply stands near the entrance. And they see that the uh, head cloth uh, has been kept separately from the rest of the pieces of linen. 
uh, that would be verse 6 and 7. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. So it looks like um, as if all of the linen covering the body um, uh, have uh, been positioned separately, and the head cloth it has been positioned separately. Uh, as if things are still in an you know still in an orderly manner now we can make two assumptions from that we can either say that the whole thing was uh, was still spread out as though you know there is a body inside it only thing of course there is no body inside it uh, so it, it's as we could we could we could read this wording as though jesus has kind of risen out through the clothing without disturbing it at all or we can just simply read it differently, where we would say um, uh, uh, the, the clothing has still kind of laid out on the slab and not uh, been flung around here and there, which would just indicate that no robbers have come inside. And I uh, you know because if the, if the robbers are planning on robbing the body and they have, and for some strange reason, they do not want to take the linen along, they would be stripping the linen, right? They would be removing all of the linen. So you would have the linen scattered all over the place. So we can read it in two ways. We can either read this um, uh, to mean that uh, no one has come inside and deliberately taken off the linen and carried away the body. Or we can just simply say uh, it's all very neatly laid out with a headpiece or, you know, on, on the top, the, the, the linen which was used for the body you know, lower down below. And uh, it's also orderly as though the body has literally whoever was inside that linen has literally come out of it without even disturbing the clothing. So we could take it in either sense. And now when I'm, I'm John wrote out this uh, wording, I'm not sure exactly which picture, which one of these two pictures he was hoping to convey. And uh, the head cloth over here, of course, is referring to the cloth, you know, which would be wrapped around the, um, the face. Uh, basically to hold the jaw in place because you know uh, once the person passes away they have no longer control over the joint it tends to open up so just to keep the jaw closed they would wrap this cloth around the head and uh, um, he observes uh, peter observes that these um, linen are in their original places and um, so we can you know we can assume from this that no grave robbers have come and said and disturbed the arrangement uh, there are some people who say that, um, you know, uh, critics who say that Jesus uh, probably had fainted and then uh, he regained conscience and after they had put him in the tomb. And that is basically what happened. So he never really actually died on the cross is what some skeptics and critics would say. Uh, but um, anyone who has actually understood the entire crucifixion process uh, would realize that um, um, the crucifixion process is something of uh, so terrible that it is almost impossible for anyone to survive it. And even if they survive it, uh, they would not have enough strength to, to just get up and walk off, you know, like as if nothing has happened. And um, uh, there's this account by Josephus, you know, one of those uh, early historians. He was a first century Jewish historian. And he talks about uh, three of his friends who underwent that uh, you know crucifixion uh, process and um, they came out of it alive but then he says that two of them died even though they were given a lot of medical care only one managed to survive just you know just managed to survive so a person who has undergone the crucifixion process uh, would not just simply be able to get up and walk away um, so um, the wrong allegations that are made you know against the crucifixion account uh, they are wrong jesus definitely did very much die on the cross it was a very much dead person who was laid in the tomb and this dead person comes back to life um, oh yeah then um and yeah, and of course, Mag uh, Mary Magdalene sees that uh, there is nobody in the tomb now. There is no body over there. And she quickly runs to tell about this uh, to the disciples. Uh, the disciples do not believe, uh, which is why they come running to check and see whether what this lady is saying is in fact true or not. And um, there's a comment made in most of the commentaries you know, at this point where they point out that um, the opinion of women was not taken too seriously as though they are incapable of observing 
uh, things correctly and uh, being able to report things correctly. It was just this attitude of their times. And uh, uh, so even in the law courts, uh, they were never regarded as witnesses. You could have a bunch of people you know, witnessing an incident taking place. But then when the court case is going on, only the men would be called as witnesses to do the to offer the testimony because it is generally believed that women um, probably don't have enough brains to be able to observe things correctly and be able to report things correctly. I mean, uh, yeah, the the status of women was not very high in those days. It was only Jesus who kind of regarded them with such respect and always saw to it that he uh, treated them most respectfully. Uh, this is generally uh, this was generally not the case in those times so it is very very um, you know significant that in a culture like that in times like that jesus chooses to um, make his first appearance to a woman he could have quite easily chosen a respectable man he could quite quite easily have chosen a respectable roman to appear to because then everyone would say, ah, Roman, uh, this powerful Roman, influential man, he was the first one to see Jesus. If he is giving the testimony, ah, then the testimony must be true. It must be correct. So Jesus could have chosen any number of people uh, you know, to be his first uh, witness. But he chooses a lady, knowing that in those times, the witness of women was not accepted seriously. It shows that Jesus viewed women very, very differently. And he deliberately chooses her to be the very first witness. Of course, when she goes and gives her testimony to the uh, disciples, uh, they do not believe. Um, OK, and um, then it goes on. To, uh, we go into verses 11 to 13. Yeah, if someone could read out verses 11 to 13. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Uh, yeah, continue please, yes. She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Uh, verse 14. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know where it was Jesus, know that it was Jesus. OK, so first she sees uh, two angels sitting inside the tomb uh, where Jesus' body had been lying. You know, on that slab over there, uh, they see she sees these two persons, and then when she looks outward where she is standing, she also sees Jesus. So the two angels are inside, and uh, Jesus is standing outside, and she sees him and she does not recognize him. And then Jesus uh, speaks to her. Uh, so, uh, yeah, if we can also have, and then, and yeah, she very clearly refers to Jesus as Lord. She says, They have taken my Lord away, you know, so uh, she uses that respectful term. And um, so she sees Jesus standing just behind her. And uh, she does not realize that this is Jesus. She assumes that it is a gardener. So if we could have uh, if someone could read out verses 15 to 18, please. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Amen. Yes. Um, now, uh, regarding this passage, you know, there are some um, very negative things which are said. Um, again, coming from a very, um, I don't know, very um, different mentality. Uh, because uh, in KJV, it says in 1720, 
uh, you know the translation goes as jesus saith unto her touch me not for i am not yet ascended to my father and um, uh, nkjv tries to you know um to tries to straighten out that translation and make it a little more accurate uh, by saying you know rather than touch uh, the word is more clinging holding on to so which is why even in our niv i um, you know uh, we have the translation saying do not hold on to me so jesus was not forbidding her from touching him uh, she he was just simply saying don't go on holding on to me because there is more to be done i now need to go to the father and complete this process this entire process of you know redemption which has been started off i need to complete it so uh, do not hold on to me do not clutch on to me so um jesus is not implying that he is going to be contaminated by being touched by a human being no uh, there's uh, there's no such um, indication here rather he is using that greek word over there uh, to say don't go on holding on to me because there's something more very something very important that needs to be done and uh, so um, that is why all the translations now uh, you know um, are very careful to uh, to use the word do not hold on or do not cling uh, rather than saying do not touch all right and uh, yeah yeah brother shay go ahead yes pastor uh, i have a question and i have an observation the first question is um you touched on the the way they um uh would i say uh buried uh, dead people in those times uh, and in a way it looked like it's something they learned from egypt but my question is um was jesus covered up because i'm i'm thinking okay he resurrected mm-hmm. what where did he of course the bible doesn't give us detail but i'm just thinking maybe if you have an idea or based on other uh, sources like uh what was he wearing what did he wear after resurrection if he was covered up m- most likely he was mummified because that was how that's what the israelites learned when they were in egypt and that was what they took out of Egypt. And you can see the parallels in the way they bury their dead people. The observation I'm just making again is that for Jesus to tell Mary not to touch him, uh, sorry, not to hold on to him, rather, like you pointed out, it shows that this was a bodily resurrection. This was a physical resurrection. I just wanted to also point that out. So just clarification on my question, man. thank you yeah now the egyptian mummification process is rather elaborate and i really doubt whether they did it for all the people who died it was only for the royalty i think that they did it and maybe for the nobles and you know on the aristocrats who could afford the entire procedure because uh, you would have specialists working on that uh, you the average person would not even know how to do that because you know uh, they would uh, make certain cuts in certain portions and remove those organs because otherwise it leads to a lot of decay uh, you know the internal organs would would, would um, decay and you have all those gases uh, you know being released and the whole thing the whole corpse gets puff, gets you know puffed up and uh, it loses its shape and a lot of terrible things go on so they would remove all of the internal organs out and in, and they would talk about how they would remove the brain right i mean they they go in through the nose cavity and they very carefully remove the brain material without cracking the skull because if they crack the skull the, the face gets d shaped so that was an elaborate process which went on for like weeks these people did not do any of that uh, but what they did do is that they would wrap the entire corpse in uh, you know linen i'm assuming it white Uh, i don't know whether they specifically used white colored linen or not but yeah they used linen to wrap it from head to uh, toe um so th- to that extent they followed the egyptian process but they did not uh, meddle with the internal organs and all of that all they did was wrap spices and herbs and things like that around uh, the uh, you know uh, they would they would they would place uh, spices and herbs and all of that to slow down the decay process and uh, even as the decay happens um, the moisture would be absorbed by these things you know by these spices and herbs so that the um, the um, you know the desiccation is the word that they use you know with where the way the whole thing kind of dries up uh, it, it to to aid that whole process of the drying up of the corpse so 
then they would put those spices and uh, herbs and then wrap the linen around that so what happens over here in this case is that it's there in a hurry uh, you know because um, um, they are, they want to uh, celebrate the passover and all of that so they are not able to go through that entire procedure correctly so they just very quickly wrap him in linen and put him off inside and now uh, uh, you know on sunday morning now they are coming over here to you know maybe so i think maybe their basic idea would have been to remove the linen put those spices and herbs and then rewrap him up you know so that the whole thing is done properly so i think that's the intention with which they now come over here uh, so what would jesus have been wearing of course they would have removed you know um, um I mean, they would have you know wiped off all the blood and all over there and they probably would have put him put a robe on him i'm not sure and i'm sure for all their dead they would do that you know they would put on some fresh clothes on the corpse before the burial process um so yeah it's different from the uh, egyptian mummification which is a very elaborate ritual um, this is something uh, more uh, more brief and also of course like you pointed out uh, she is able to cling on to him because he has a physical body uh, so he's not vapor uh he is not a ghost he is very much a physical person and that is why she is either holding on to his uh, arm or she is holding on to his feet and she is uh, you know so uh, so happy not able to let go and he says don't cling to me because i have something very important to do and what is that important thing he says i have not yet ascended to the father so this is something that he needs to uh, do but it's interesting to see that he waits immediately after the resurrection he could have just gone away to the father ascended to the father and finished the redemption process but he first wanted to inform them first he wanted to assure them that he's alive and well and there's something so beautiful about this you see now these people are all his family they're not just his disciples and his followers they are his family and you let the family know that you're fine that things are okay you know things are fine so he first wants to give them that assurance that you know i'm back everything is fine it's all right and then after giving them that word of assurance then he goes to the father and uh, um, so we have this very beautiful wording over here uh, where he's saying go instead to my brothers and tell them i am ascending to my father and your father and to my god and your god and there's so much beauty in these verses you know uh, so they're all one family now and uh, he's saying you know go tell my brothers um he could have just simply you know, uh, you know refer to them as disciples or or whatever but he says go to my brothers and he's using the the word brothers here very specifically because he goes on to say my father and your father indicating that now they are one family and now god is uh, you know uh, because that's what he had told them earlier you know when uh, during john chapter 15 and uh, you know 16 17 where the discussion was going on there jesus very clearly says to them he says the you will be loved by the father in the same way he loves me the same way the father loves me he will love you as well and um, so here jesus gives the instruction to mary go tell them this good news you know that i am alive that i am well and uh, then talking about uh, my father your father saying all of that then he leaves okay so um that is significant now um the next verses would be uh verse 19 onwards so before we actually get into verse 19 uh let's look at uh, you know the sequence of events uh, because this is where a lot of debate goes on uh, so we are kind of you know um delaying this a little bit and we're going to get into some details regarding uh, how exactly what were the sequence of events which took place uh, just so that you know we would have a little more clarity um, because when we usually do our uh, devotional reading we read this passages differently and we don't really think about the sequence of events you know we are just basically looking for the meat for the main uh, uh, learnings which we can gain 
and that's an excellent way of going about you know looking at the bible but then those who also are interested in historical details and the and and the uh, the order in which the whole uh, thing took place the events and all of that they they point out uh, and they say oh look look at the number of disparities there are here it says one thing and there in the other gospel it says another thing and it looks like these people have no clue what they are talking about so maybe it's just it's, it's uh, this whole thing is just, just a uh, story that they fabricated uh, because they wanted to act as if Jesus has been raised, but actually Jesus was, never did rise from the dead. So it's what the uh, is the allegation which skeptics make. So it kind of helps us to have a clearer picture of what happened first, what happened next, what was the sequence of events. Okay, so um, this may take up a little time, uh, but I think it should be useful down the line uh, because you know we'll always be studying the gospels uh, and. Uh, these questions will always arise. So it helps if we have a little bit of clarity in our mind on how these uh, events might have proceeded one after the other. Okay, so um, now if you look at Matthew chapter 28, um, where it talks about, um, you know, the women going to the tomb, there it talks about uh, an angel who speaks to the women. Okay, that would be Matthew chapter Okay, maybe you can just write down these four, uh, you know, passages so that you can look them up at your leisure later on. Uh, you have Matthew chapter 28, verses 5 to 8. And then you have Mark 16, um, 2 to 8. Then you have Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 8. And then, of course, now here you have John 20. Um, so in Matthew 28, it says that the women go over there and then an angel speaks to, you know, it talks about one angel speaking to the women. And uh, he says, you know, he's no longer here. He has risen. And uh, it says in verse 8, they left the tomb quickly uh, with the good news and they go back, okay, um, uh, to the disciples. Now, coming to uh, Mark uh, chapter 16, there it talks about... Um, they saw that the stone was rolled away in verse 4. And then Mark 16, verse 5, over there it says, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe. So over here, again, we seem to have one single person speaking, one single angel speaking. And again, he gives the news saying, you know, uh, uh, he's no longer here. He has risen. And so then they leave. Now we come to Luke chapter 24. In Luke chapter 24, um, again in uh, verse 2, uh, they see that the stone is rolled away. Uh, and um, in verse 4, it says, while they were wondering what's going on, you know, then you have two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling cloth clothing. And uh, they say to him, he is not here. He has uh, risen. And um, yeah, then we come to uh, the John chapter 20. So in some places you see uh, two angels being mentioned. In some places you have uh, one angel being mentioned. Um, kind of makes you wonder what's going on. Uh, you have a clue in, in Luke chapter 24, verse 4. Uh, okay, verses 3 and 4. Luke 24, 3 and 4. When they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, Two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing, and then you have the wording. Um, uh, so uh, the sequence of events probably is something like this, uh, where you have the women going over there to the tomb. And when they go over there, they do not see the body of Jesus. And um, in some places, it says one angel appeared and, and gave the explanation. In some places, it says that two angels appeared and gave the explanation. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, did the ladies kind of disperse and start searching, looking to see whether uh, the body of Jesus, is, you know, has been hidden somewhere else? So because they all seem to have had separate encounters uh, and they all come back giving different reports. Some of them talk about seeing one person. Some of them talks about seeing two persons. And uh, um, uh, there's a, so I, I, I get the idea that they would not just stand there as one group. They were kind of moving around, uh, you know, maybe looking. And uh, then they go and they uh, report saying, you know, the body is um, missing. Um, 
we would have to look at a few more verses to get this whole sequence you know uh, together uh, but just keep the, keep this in mind um let's look at mark chapter 16 verses 9 to 14 where you have uh, more additional details being given and now things kind of you know start getting a bit clearer so actually if we could have someone read out for us please mark chapter 16 verses 9 to 14 and i say unto you make to yourselves friends of the uh, mark mark chapter 16 sorry sorry yes Nine. Now when Jesus was risen early in the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out mm. of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Mm. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven, as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Okay, so here uh, you know, it's, it's very clearly pointed out that Jesus first appears to Mary Magdalene, and then uh, um, later he appears to the two uh, men who are walking, you know, on the road to Emmaus. And then next he appears to the eleven. Now all of these events are happening on Sunday itself. Okay, on that one, uh, on that first Sunday, uh, one after the other. These are the appearances. Uh, so first you have uh, the appearance to Mary, and then afterwards the two men who were on the road to Emmaus. And then later in the evening Jesus appears to the eleven or rather I should say 10, because only 10 of them are present on that occasion. Thomas is not with them. Um, uh, so now let's again uh, look at another passage, Luke chapter 24, verses 9 to 16. Now again, here you have some additional details, which will kind of help us to make the entire picture clearer. So Luke 24, 9 to 16, if someone can read out. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and several other women who told the apostles what happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to men. So they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the uh, empty lion wrapped Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. Okay, so um, now, you know, if we put all of this together, uh, we, we see that the ladies go together uh, to the tomb, they do not see the body, and they are wondering where it is. I'm assuming they, you know, start looking around, and uh, these two angels go around informing them. You know, uh, so either I, maybe they approach the ladies separately, or maybe there were two of them together, and and one man approaches them, and another man goes to, you know, the other angel goes to speak to the other women. Don't know exactly what is involved, but it looks like they were kind of spread out and. Uh, uh, then after the angels have told them, you know, go back and inform the disciples that he is risen. Uh, now they all come back to tell about this, you know, and it looks like Mary does not go back immediately with them. She seems to be continuing to stand over there outside the tomb and uh, she is weeping because she has not heard what the others have heard, you know, from the other uh, the, uh, the angels uh, because it looks like she's alone by herself when this particular incident takes place. But we also very clearly know that Jesus, uh, that um, the uh, angels have appeared to the ladies and the ladies have departed you know, to talk about it. Uh, so which means she is kind of maybe uh, separated from the rest of them and she's still standing over there weeping. And when she looks in, she on her own sees the two angels over there. And then uh, you know she starts talking to them and then she sees Jesus. 
so the first appearance of jesus happens um you know with her uh, he speaks to her then she quick, quickly goes running and um, um uh, okay okay earlier uh, so sorry if you see in the very beginning she does not see his body and then it says over there she went running back to tell them that the body was not there and then the um, peter and john come running to find out whether this is true or not okay but here in luke it says the women go and inform what they have heard then peter and uh, comes running in luke chapter 24 verse 12 so either peter and john came running to see what happened uh in the beginning before the angel encounter or peter and john come running after the angel encounter is finished and the ladies have finished telling the entire story so that we do not know whether peter and john went running before the ladies spoke to the angels or peter and john went running after uh, the ladies had finished speaking to the angels okay there's no uh, clarity on that but the rest of the story seems to be uh, that mary is somehow separated from the other crowds and uh, from the from the rest from the rest of the ladies and she has a personal encounter with jesus at this particular point okay so um all of these events are taking place on sunday uh, one after the other and finally in the evening jesus comes to uh, the room where all these um, you know disciples are gathered uh, yes yes brother kennedy please go ahead You, okay, um, uh, you have a question. It says that you have raised your hand, um, Brother Kennedy. Otherwise, we'll, we'll carry on. Maybe, you know, you, he accidentally pressed the thing. So, okay, we move into verse 19. If someone could read out verse 19. Can I proceed? Oh, yes, go question. ahead. Yes, ha, yeah. It when he was in the tomb, if Jesus does die when he was in the tomb, your, your voice is coming and going. If you could, you know, start the question again. Yeah. I'm asking whether if Jesus died when he was in the tomb. Mm. He died on the cross because uh, it is, uh, you know, um, established. Uh, they are checking all the three uh, bodies of the people hung on the cross and uh, they break the bones of the uh, other two because they have not yet died but when they come to Jesus body they realize that he's already dead and so they do not break his legs you know to to, to because they want to quicken the process of di dying because we, a person can hang on that cross for uh, 3 4 days before they actually die but now they are in a hurry because passover has to be celebrated and so um, where they the other two um, uh, robbers who have been hung on the cross uh, their bones are broken to hasten the process of death but when they come to the body of jesus they see that he's already dead and so they don't bother breaking the bones but just to be on the safe side they pierce on the side with a spear and when they when they pierce him with a spear uh, you have uh, blood and water coming out uh, you know showing that he is already dead so no he did not die in the tomb he was already dead on the cross uh, where it says you know in one of the chapters that uh, after having finished everything he uh, you know gave up his spirit so um, the process of death happens on the cross when jesus decides to give up his spirit uh, he does not die in the tomb later asking this is that in christology we are taught that jesus was a hundred percent god hundred percent man does he mean yes. god can die uh, does, does he mean god can die because in christology we are taught that jesus is a hundred percent god hundred percent man so if you tell us he died on the, on the cross does it mean god can die yes the uh, human part of him which chose to become human it died as our representative you know so which is why it was necessary for god to be trinity to be triune so that uh, he could uh, uh, you know accomplish this entire thing and so we only catch glimpses of that we do not know all of the details but uh, one thing is for sure you know god did not cease to exist when jesus died on the cross god was still very much there because god is a triune god he was very much still very much alive and continuing to exist uh, so 
he he never died god never died but there was one aspect of him which chose to become our representative and die on the cross for us uh, so that aspect of him very much went through a death so did god himself die no he is a triune god and he was alive he continued to be alive and he'll always be alive but this aspect of him where he chose to become a human and uh, take on a human body and live with us and you know uh, suffer along with us that aspect of him yes most definitely died now how do we reconcile this this aspect of him with the triune uh, godhead which continued to always exist those details are not given in the bible there is no explanation given of how we are we are supposed to reconcile the humanness of jesus with the triune god who always existed the details of it are not given but uh, the facts are set out that the human aspect of him with the son who chose to become one of us he did die that fact has been established and god having always been there from beginning to end that also is established how these two facts can be explained that has not been given to us in the bible so those details we do not know yeah 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 thank you yes um so yeah if uh, maybe one of us could read out verses um verse 19 yeah maybe maybe just verse 19 if someone could read out please that sunday when the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the jewish leaders suddenly jesus was standing there among them peace be with you he said yeah so um they have uh, afraid of the jews of what action the jews may take against them they have already finished uh, crucifying their master and lord so now they do not know what they are going to do with the followers so these people are very scared and they have you know closed themselves behind doors and jesus appears to them um, you know by entering through the door i mean he doesn't ask them to open the door he literally comes into the room even though the door is closed and the words he speaks to them is peace be with you so they are very terrified they are very scared but he is speaking peace to them and he says you know you don't do not need to be afraid um uh, and so um they are given the assurance that uh, everything is under control and they no longer need to fear because he is with them they were feeling abandoned they were feeling afraid they did not know uh, how things were going to go now onwards now that jesus is no longer there and they are living in this much fear and they are that terrified because they have refused to believe the loving report which jesus sent them in the morning even before ascending to the father what's the first thing that he does he first wants to assure them give them that uh, that comfort you know to tell them that now everything is okay i am alive he sent them that word but these guys refused to believe it Uh, again and you know that it, it so clearly brings out this in mark which we read mark chapter 16 first you have mary come in giving giving the report along with the women they refuse to believe then it says in mark 16:12 uh, the two people on uh, on the road to emmaus again they give the report and it says over there they did not believe and then um, uh, then it says in verse 14 of mark 16 no work mark 16 verse 14 it says uh, then jesus appeared to the 11 and he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal so uh, we see that um, these people are trembling over here and full of fear not because they were not given the good news it's just that they chose not to believe it and so now jesus appears to them in the room and he says peace be with you why are you scared i get i sent you a good report you should have believed it why have you not believed it so peace be with you don't be scared there's nothing to be scared of we'll continue this after the you know after we take our 10 minute break so at 10 o'clock if all of us could rejoin please uh yeah and we have people who have raised their hands we'll deal with that once we come back with, uh, from our break at 10 o'clock thank you <laughs> 